PSR's Director of Instructional Resources, and I will be your um, tour guide today for maximizing your ICPSR membership value. You'll hear at the end of this presentation that this is actually one of a series um, that we're putting together. So today's presentation is sort of what I like to think of as the view from 30,000 feet. So this is a quick overview of lots of different um, tools and resources we have for you and your users. Um, and then we will have uh, more in-depth webinars about um, some of these topics later on this summer. So today we'll talk a little bit about the summer program. We'll talk about data. We'll talk about um, teaching tools, the paper competition, um, ways that you can encourage use on your own campuses um, with things that we provide so you don't have to do as much work. Um, and then I'll give you a sneak peek at something that's super exciting. Um, and I promised I wouldn't say very much about it. And so I'm gonna try to hold to that. But I think you'll see when we get to the end, it's pretty exciting. Um, so when we stand in the exhibit booth at um, many of the conferences that we attend, um, when there are conferences and no COVID, um, Anna, Linda, and I, who are all on this webinar, um, often hear two comments. Um, the first, when people see our banners and um, come up to the exhibit booth is, hey, ICPSR, I went to your summer program in, enter year, um, that was the best summer or summers I've ever had. Um, and we tend to find that people um, who come often come back. Um, so I want to point out that that is one really big uh, part of who ICPSR is, and it's a way that your membership um, really has value for the, the individuals at your institution. Um, this summer's summer program will be entirely virtual. Um, the University of Michigan has um, made all of its spring and summer uh, courses virtual, so we have done the same thing. Um, there are approximately 80 different courses. Um, and if you think about it, this year is a really good year to have um, students try things out, right? So there's no commitment to living in Ann Arbor or somewhere else for four weeks at a time. Um, the fact that the courses are virtual means that um, the, the fees, the tuition has been reduced a little bit as well. Um, so this is a great time to try out the summer program. Um, but it's not just about classes. There's so much more. Um, the thing that we hear all the time from people who participate in the summer program is that they really appreciate being able to network with other participants and faculty, um, teaching assistants from all over the world. Um, we usually draw about a thousand students um, per summer. Um, this summer, again, it will be virtual, um, but they are the summer program staff is fabulous and they're working on um, trying to make all of those networking opportunities still happen um, in the virtual world. <coughs> Excuse me. So while it may not be a pig roast um, this year, there will be other ways for uh, people to meet each other and find out where their common interests are and even um, talk about potential collaborations and things like that. Um, in addition to the classes and the networking, uh, the summer program offers what they call Blaylock lectures. Um, almost every evening of the program, it's there's quite a range of um, topics and um, really if you uh, participate in the summer program and your board it's probably because you're missing out on something because they don't give very much downtime at all um, in terms of options that you can um, you can participate in uh, the blaylock lectures um, range in topics from getting your work published in a journal um, to teaching statistics um, this year there might be a a Blaylock on teaching in general. Um, uh, you might get introduced to some amazing projects being carried out by social scientists at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research and elsewhere. Um, so I like to think about it as a good way to brush up on statistics, um, but also it's a great um, environment in which you can be 
um, exposed to career options that are outside of maybe the traditional academic positions. Um, I know last year one of the Blaylock lectures was given by um, Trent Alexander, who is ICPSR's associate director, and he talked about uh, a project, um, I believe it's called the American Opportunities Project, um, where they're actually linking census data from the 1800s through 2020. Um, and if that's not an amazing uh, undertaking and project with um, so much potential for future research, um, I don't know what is, but that's the kind of thing that um, participants are routinely uh, exposed to. Um, and people often think that the summer program is um, only courses on sort of the latest and greatest statistical techniques. Um, we have those courses. Uh, we have a lot of those courses, but we also have courses like um, Math for Social Sciences 1 and 2 um, or uh, Linear Regression 1, 2, and 3. So um, beginning uh, data analysis one and two. So um, it really, there is a place for everyone along the um, sort of the statistical learning continuum. Um, there are scholarships for the summer program. The deadline for this year's applications have passed, um, but it's definitely something to keep in mind um, for next year. Um, the scholarships range um, in terms of criteria, from uh, your deg degree or discipline um, to the, the specific topic area within a discipline that you might be studying to um, uh, one of them, the Hank Heidewitt Scholarship is for people who have already attended the summer program once um, uh, and different professional associations have scholarships as well that have different um, criteria. So definitely check out the website. And um, as Anna mentioned at the beginning, these slides will be emailed to you. And um, all of this stuff is hyperlinked in there. So you can just jump right to the, the page that talks about the summer program itself and the scholarships. So this is just a, a final plug. Um, again, with some different example uh, courses. This one is machine learning applications in the social science. Um, the summer program is more and more getting courses. Uh, they've had courses in R for quite some time, but now they're including Python um, and some of the, um, the different programs and um, ways of analyzing data that are used by data scientists as well as by social scientists. Um, so I encourage you to check out the list of courses. Um, the, the four-week sessions um, begin on June 22nd. Um, we've already had some of the short workshops um, take place successfully in the virtual um, world. So we look forward to a very exciting um, first session beginning on June 22nd, about a month from now. So you still have time to think about whether one of those courses might be for you. Um, the other comment that we often hear is, Oh, ICPSR, I used data from you guys back when I did my dissertation in, enter the date. Um, usually it's, it's someone who, um, when, they, when they tell us how long ago it's been, uh, they often say that with some sort of, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been in this field for that long kind of thing. Um, but that's the other reaction that we get. And so um, ICPSR, of course, is known for the data that we hold. Um, we will be doing a, a webinar specifically on member-only data. Um, that's the next one coming up in this um, Maximizing Your Membership Value series. Um, but I thought I'd give you a teaser here. So um, this is a list of the 10 most popular, um, as judged by most downloads, um, member-only data sets for um, this fiscal year. So, July 1st, 2019 through yesterday. And you can see that they kind of really span um, a, a lot of different topical areas. So the Collaborative um, Psychiatric and Epi Epidemiology Surveys is a collection of different mental health and well-being surveys that were collected um, around the world. Um, they've been harmonized and put together into uh, what we call CES. Um, and that is always a popular um, data set. 
uh, the American National Election Studies 2016 Time Series Study, um, another all-time uh, favorite. In fact, the American National Election Study was one of the first studies in the ICPSR catalog. Um, the, the PIs of that study were among the founders of ICPSR. Um, and its use has continued consistently throughout um, our history. Uh, the General Social Survey, of course, another um, omnibus survey with lots of different kinds of topics. Um, we have the cumulative file going up to 2016. Um, uh, the next one is how couples meet and stay together. Um, so a study of relationship dynamics, um, the youth development study, um, everything down to um, the United States agricultural data from 1840 um, to 2012. So again, um, I was when I put this list together, I was surprised to see the University of Michigan's campus climate survey um, show up as one of our most popular downloads. I think it had um, almost 400 uh, downloads. So interesting things show up in that list. Um, and you can actually contribute to that list um, and to future social science. Um, and I put social in parentheses because who knows what data can be used for um, now and into the future. So um, things that we uh, never would have thought were social science data are now making their way into our archive. Um, things like biological specimens and brain scan images and things like that. So um, the future only knows what uh, the data that you might contribute could be used for. Um, we have several different deposit options. Um, you can self-publish your data in what we call open ICPSR. Um, you immediately get a, um, a digital object identifier and a citation. So you can put it on your CV and show that you've fulfilled requirements of data sharing um, for any federal contractor, anything like that. Um, and then we also, of course, have our curated data, which is what the member um, funded data is all about. Um, that's where the um, your annual uh, subscription dues pays for the curation and making those data available to the people in your institutions, um, essentially forever. Uh, so the next bullet point is we promise to care for um, the data forever. Um, actually, in uh, digital in the digital preservation world, they talk about at least five years as being um, the criteria. But uh, ICPSR is, six, is 58 years old. It was founded in um, 1962, so um, we've got a track record that shows that it it'll probably be around for a lot more than five years. Um, and when we curate those data, we make them available to users with full documentation. Um, a citation that shows who collected the data, so you get credit for that, um, as well as making them available in different file formats for the different statistical packages. So that's all stuff that we do on, your, on our end. You don't have to worry about doing that work if you're thinking about depositing data with us. Um, I mentioned on the slide that we're a Core Trust SEAL certified repository. That means we will have your your data for at least five years in a usable format. Um, and most importantly, we can actually help you show how your work has impacted um, social and other sciences. So I mentioned that we give you the DOI so that you can always point to your data. Um, we, we create the citation for the data as well. Um, and we also keep track of all of the publications that are based on the data in our holdings. Um, and so if you click on a study page, um, you'll see the number of, um, of different publications that were based on those data. And so we'll do that for you as well. Um, and you can see not only the number, but what they were. So you, you can show the breadth of impact that your work has had. Um, and then we also provide download counts for both data and documentation. Um, again, sort of as a way to um, to show uh, perhaps a promotion and tenure committee um, that your work really is getting um, taken and used by other social scientists. 
so we are the summer program. We are data, but there's more. Um, so there are other things that ICPSR offers that many people don't realize um, they actually get as part of their membership. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, that we actually have a section on the website for teaching and learning with ICPSR. Um, and again, this is another topic that will be covered more in depth in a later webinar, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but we have uh, several um, series of ready-made exercises. Um, I don't know if any of you remember these um, lovely uh, TV dinners. I used to think that they were fantastic when I was a kid because um, we didn't get them very often. But you can think of our exercises as just like that. They're ready to pop into the syllabus and um, you're ready to go. So um, all of the exercises that you find on our website have been written by teaching faculty. Um, so they've got an idea of what works and what doesn't in the classroom. Um, a lot of the, the exercise modules um, actually came from faculty using them in their own classroom before they shared them with us. So um, you, you have some uh, sense of security that um, it'll work for your students. All of them are Creative Commons licensed, so you can take them and as long as you uh, cite the original one, you can do whatever you want. You can take screenshots and drop them into your lecture notes. You can send students to the site and have them work through things. Um, however you want to use them um, and we always welcome new submissions so if you do anything with icpsr data in your teaching um, we would be happy to feature it on our website of course giving you full credit for it um, and again a data citation um, so that uh, you can help um, show impact so our teaching and learning modules have um, what i've come to think of is sort of different levels of engagement when we first started thinking about um, offering resources for undergraduate education, um, we heard a lot from faculty members that they wanted something that they could use within the course that they already taught without having to completely remake their course. Um, and so, uh, so we kept that in mind as we were, as we were developing the different um, types of teaching materials that we have. Um, we also heard that um, when faculty members had students buy workbooks, this was still back in the day of, um, of actual print texts and workbooks, um, they, they felt obligated to use the entire thing um, when they might not have really wanted to. So again, that sort of structured our thinking. Um, so we have data-driven learning guides, um, which is sort of the one and done. Um, you can use one, you can use, uh, we have 51 of them up on the website, so you can use one or 51. Um, they were intended for introductory social science courses, um, but we know that they're used um, in a range of courses, including um, graduate nursing programs and uh, graduate programs in criminal justice, as well as statistics and methods classes. and. Um, more substantive, both introductory level, like sociology, um, political science, uh, education classes, as well as um, uh, topical seminars. So they range in topics um, from attitudes to uh, body image, to religion, to voting in different countries. Um, all kinds of different topics. Um, when we created them, it was done with um, the background of a number of introductory uh, textbooks. So we looked for concepts that were common across courses um, so that we could create something that would have um, the biggest potential um, audience. So again, I would encourage you to just um, check out the list of those um, that's on the website. We also have longer exercise sets. Um, so these are things that really work better if you use all of the exercises in the set, um, as opposed to sort of the one and done. Um, so our most popular one of that um, is voting behavior in the 2016 election, um, which is called setups, uh, which setup stands for um, supplementary empirical teaching units in political science. 
Um, some of you who have been teaching for a while may know that that is actually a series that goes back to the 70s. Um, they are created by Chuck Prisby and um, Carmine Scavo, um, who have both threatened to retire before the 2020 election version. Um, they threatened that before 2016, but they uh, they hadn't retired by then. Um, they they said that they were really serious this time, but they have actually already lined up people that they um, are sort of uh, grooming to write the the 2021. So uh, we will definitely have a 2020 um, setups as well. Usually that comes out. Um, in the fall after the election, um, because it takes a little while. It's based on the American National Election Study. So it takes a while for ICPSR to get those data and then process the data so that they can be used in the exercise. Um, other exercise sets that we have are exploring data through research literature, which takes uh, makes use of the bibliography to show students essentially that research um, isn't conducted in a vacuum. Uh, that one was created by a, um, a librarian, a data librarian, uh, Rachel Barlow at Trinity College, and she said that she was tired of um, getting the question, uh, having students from the senior capstone class, like in sociology, come to her and say, my teacher said I need to do something with the general social survey, what should I do? And so she um, created this exercise set in response to that. So um, the faculty member has to choose a beginning uh, point through the bibliography, and then the exercises guide students to find um, articles by the same author, maybe using different data to study the same topic, or by the same author with a different co-author, um, studying a, a different topic or something like that. So it um, shows students essentially that the topic that they pick for their senior capstone project doesn't have to be what they study for the rest of their lives. Um, uh, lastly, we have Investigating Community and Social Capital, um, written by uh, Lori Weber. I was blanking on her name for a minute. Um, a political science faculty member um, who wrote this actually and used it with her research methods classes. So it uses um, the general social survey and works through the, um, the analyses that Robert Putnam includes in his book, Bowling Alone. And it shows students how to use the, um, the code book for operationalization, how to, how to run some of the analyses, and then prompts them to, um, to go a little bit further and explore something that wasn't in the book. Um, we also have a number of modules that are housed elsewhere. Um, and now I'm blanking again. It, Ed, Ed Nelson, also in California, um, has created a number of exercises using the general social survey that we link to on our website. They're actually housed in the um, social science something. I can't remember. <laughs> um, it's, at, it's housed. Um, in the Cal State system. But anyway, um, again, modules like the ones that he used in his class, um, he has graciously allowed us to link to those um, because they do rely on data in our holdings. Um, you can also use a number of our, of our data tools um, for teaching in the classroom. So uh, we have an online analysis tool. We have a couple of them actually, but um, just knowing that the capability is there is um, really great, especially for virtual classrooms. Um, so the online analysis tools mean that students from anywhere can access data without having to have um, any statistical package. So they don't have to download the data, they don't have to open them in SPSS or anything like that. Um, so that's a great tool for bringing data into even a even a statistics class or a research methods class, um, but definitely also fabulous for introductory level kinds of social science classes. Uh, we also have a number of research briefs and research reports in our bibliography that are um, really good ways to introduce students to scientific writing. Um, they're usually a little bit more uh, easy, easily digestible than um, maybe a journal article might be. Um, 
And I often point out that when students read these research briefs, um, they're usually uh, descriptive statistics um, at best in the in the reports. And so it helps them to realize that they're actually getting uh, getting skills as well um, that they can use. So again, using the research briefs in teaching is a um, another way to to use ICPSR. Um, and then finally, our social science variables database is a great question bank um, tool for teaching operationalization, um, looking at sampling differences, all that kind of stuff. Um, we also have uh, resources created specifically for students. So um, most of your libraries probably have a resource on how to read a journal article. Um, we found that the more places students can trip over that kind of information, the more likely it is that they're um, going to pick it up. So we have a we also have a um, how to read a journal article little um, two page. Uh, sheet that teaches students sort of what to look for in each section of the journal article. So if you're looking for information about the sample, where do you find that? If you're looking for the rationale behind the study, where do you find that? Um, because we all kind of know that you don't read every word of the journal article with the same care. Um, but, but that's something that we've sort of learned as, by doing it. And so we wanted to help students um, kind of figure that out a little bit earlier. Um, the next one is a guide to interpreting SPSS output. Um, this is a basic uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. Um, and looking at the template reminds me that it probably needs to be um, redone because that's like two PowerPoint templates ago. Um, but anyway, it includes all of the analyses that are included in an introductory level um, statistics class. So everything from frequency distributions uh, through uh, measures of central tendency, um, bivariate relations, and, and it ends at multiple regression with dummy variables. Um, and the, the idea behind the resources is that it um, tells students how to interpret the output. And we used SPSS because at the time, um, that's what most people were using. I think that is still the case for um, often for introductory uh, stat classes. But it, um, as you can see from the, the second slide there, each of the numbers in the output, um, an example of one of them is interpreted uh, next to the output so that students know how to, what to look for, where, and how to interpret the results that they're seeing. It also tells why you would want to use a specific um, statistical analysis. Um, we have a paper competition. Um, this is only for students at member institutions, um, for both undergraduate students and master's level students. Um, and we just yesterday announced the 2020 winners. Um, both the first place and second place undergraduate winner were from Elizabethtown College. Um, it was uh, clearly a paper um, that they had done for their um, uh, sociology capstone course. Um, I was one of the judges for this, and as I was reading it, I was like, hmm, the format of this paper is really kind of um, familiar to me. And then I looked at the one from the other winner, and I was like, yep, that's why. <laughs> um, but it, what a great thing for your university. Um, they, that was something that they had written for a course. Um, they just submitted it as it was, and um, the first place winner got $1,000, second place gets $750, um, and we published their paper in a, a special um, edition of our bulletin as well as online, um, so that gives them something that they can put on their CV. Uh, we had a first place master's um, paper this year from uh, Baylor University as well. Again, uh, $1,000 to that um, to that student. In addition to having data and tools for teaching, um, we have some resources that will help you um, help others make use of ICPSR resources. Um, so I, I sort of titled this section um, Tools for Encouraging Use, but you'll notice the asterisk um, 
points out that actually it's really it's about ICPSR use, but it's broader than that. It's about good data practices in general. Um, so the two that I highlighted on this slide are, um, we have a brand new, uh, just published this January, I believe, um, Guide to Social Science Data Archiving, uh, sorry, Guide to Social Science Data Preservation and Archiving. Um, uh, that's the sixth edition of that. Um, and that's just, really gives good foundational data management advice. How should you name variables? How should you um, code your responses? Uh, what information should you keep with your data so that you make sure that if you're going to share it, somebody else can make meaningful use of it? Um, we also have guidelines for effective data management plans. Um, and those are the data management plan um, advice is good whether you're planning to um, deposit your data with ICPSR or put it somewhere else. Um, they're, they're pretty generic in terms of uh, the advice that they give. It's not like, um, you know, we make you promise your firstborn son that you will give us your data um, if you use the, the data management plan tool. So um, we also will help you if, you're, if the intention is that you're planning to share data with ICPSR at the end of your process. Uh, project. Um, our acquisitions team is happy to take a look at what you're proposing and um, help come up with a budget maybe for um, if you want to uh, share it and make it available to everyone, not just member institutions. Um, so they'll help you write that, um, that part of the grant proposal or whatever it is that you're working on. Um, we also have a number of ways of promoting ICPSR. Um, so there are ready to use materials on our website on the membership page. Again, these images are hyperlinked, so they'll take you right to it. Um, everything from social media posts to PowerPoint presentations uh, to printed ma materials. Um, we try to make what we put out available to you um, so that you can use it on your campus if you find it helpful. Um, there's there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel if something is going to work. Um, so again, most of our stuff is Creative Commons licensed, so um, you can take it and use it as you wish. Uh, we also have um, the second sort of column there is our ICPSR 101 um, playlist on YouTube. So everything from depositing data to what is data curation to why should I cite data and how should I cite data. So that's a great one for um social research classes uh, there are mo many more um, than i could fit on the screen um, so again i encourage you just to take a look at that as well uh, we do webinars by request um, so anything from a general introduction to icpsr to using data in the classroom or um, the topics of our, our different topical archives, or if there's a particular one that you're interested in, um, we'll have someone from that archive do a webinar um, for your campus. Um, data management plans, depositing options, um, just about anything we do, we're happy to talk about. Um, and lastly, we are on, uh, thanks to Anna um, and her, her crew, we are on just about every social media platform. Um, that you can think of. So this is Instagram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Um, and so these are uh, examples um, of ways that you can kind of get new uh, stories from ICPSR um, if you're using those to uh, promote data use among your faculty and students. And finally, I promised you some sneak peeks. Um, so this one is the one I promised I would not say anything about. I would just tease it, but I have to say that I am super excited about this um, and watch for it. Hopefully you'll hear a webinar about it um, by the end of the summer. It's a really cool effort. Um, and then again, I mentioned at the beginning um, that this webinar is the first in a series. The second one is on Wednesday, June 3rd, and that one will include um, hidden gems of ICPSR, a peek at, into the data vault. Um, as we were thinking about potential titles for this, Linda um, reminded us of the Geraldo Rivera um, uh, 
TV episode where they did the live look into the vault and didn't find anything. I promise you we will find things. Um, we will. Uh, we plan to take a deep dive um, and show you some data sets that you probably never even imagined that we had. Um, just as a teaser, did you know that we have data from 11, what is it, 1164 to 1264? Um, I had no idea. Anyway, um, you can join Anna and I for that one. Um, and at that one, we will introduce the next one. So with that, um, any questions? Sorry, I feel like I've been talking super fast. Um, I see a question pop up about, can you get the slides? Yep, they will be sent to you um, via email along with a copy of the presentation. Any other questions or comments? Um, Linda and Anna are on here too, so they're happy to answer. Um, there's a question about for the three day workshop that begins next week, when is the last day to register? Um, I don't know that information off the top of my head, but I would direct you to the summer program website. If it doesn't say it on there, there's an email um, that you can, uh, an email address that you can use to send questions to the summer program staff, and they will um, definitely know the answer to that. Other than that, I am not seeing any um, any other questions. Linda or Anna, do you want to say anything in closing? This is Linda. Um, I would just like to thank you all for um, attending the webinar and for for those of you that um, and for being members of ICPSR um, and for hanging with each other and supporting the data community throughout. COVID-19. So, um, and I was just trying to look real quick for the summer program workshop uh, question. And I, I think generally the answer to that is that you can, you can register up until the day before, but with the virtual environment, um, if you have plans to do so, I, I get in there right away. Some of these workshops do have limited seats. And so, um, um, that's also a factor. So, but for the best answer, as Lynette said, is just go to our website, Google ICPSR, hit the front page, and then click on the summer program link, and it's going to give you all the information you need on that web page. And we hope that you will attend. And I did see one um, other question pop in um, about where can we find out more information about the census research project. Um, that's collecting data since the 1800s. Um, that was actually a session that we did at our um, official representatives meeting um, on campus last October-ish. Um, um, and all of the sessions from that workshop were recorded and are put on our YouTube channel. Um, so there was, there was definitely a, a session about that. Um, just look for um, census in the title or Trent Alexander and um, dang I should never try to say names on on these webinars um, Katie Genedek was his um, co-presenter uh, so just look for one of those two names and you should be able to find it it's a fabulous project Hi everyone, this is Anna jumping back in. Um, apologies for the lawnmower that's happening outside. Um, just another update on that summer program. Um, if anyone is trying to register for summer program classes that are taking place um, in the next uh, couple of weeks, um, in particular, we had a question about the process tracing workshop. 
Um, the registration for those classes is going to close on the 22nd, which is this Friday. Um, so do please get in your registration quickly if you are planning to attend those classes. Again, that process tra tracing workshop is starting May 27th. So, um, so that registration is closing on the 22nd, which is this Friday. Um, and I also just wanted to give a giant, enormous, huge, much appreciation. Thank you to Dr. Holter for hosting this because I learned a few things and I look at this presentation constantly. So, oh my gosh, you are incredible. And I so appreciate your help on um, getting this information out and making sure that people know what can be used in the classroom and beyond. This is some really incredible resources and, uh, and I'm really excited to see how everybody uses it at your campuses. Okay, thanks for spending the afternoon with us. And yes, Anna, I will do whatever it is that you um, want me to do after that flattering comment. All right, well with that, thank you all so much for being here. Again, the slides and the recording will be sent to you um, following this webinar. Um, if you do have any questions or if there were any questions um, that were sent in that we didn't get to, um, we will review those afterwards and message you directly. Um, or you can always send us a message at icpsr-help at umich.edu. You'll find that on our website as well. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you for all of the messages that have been sent in in the questions and the comments. We really appreciate that and read every single one. Um, with that, we hope you and yours are staying well and healthy. And we look forward to seeing all of the great data work that comes out of um, of your work with ICPSR. Thank you so much for being here and we will see you on June 3rd for the Hidden Gems webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon.